Good morning and welcome Cornerstone Church and visitors. It is wonderful to gather together, whether online or in person. If you are online, please remember to make use of the prayer request button. If at any point part of the service resonates with you, then please press that button and uh, you'll be directed to a private conversation with our online hosts. There, you can pray together or take the conversation further. Many among us have experienced grief in some form over the past few months. Grief from loss of freedom, loss of income, loss of security, or loss of a loved one. And this week especially, we think of Michael and Alison Khadise, who lost both their grandmother and an uncle, Letu and Beverly Kapuaja, who lost their grandmother, Daisy Mueller, who lost her aunt, Zita and Fernando Ribeiro and family who lost their mother slash grandmother. Myself and my wife also lost our grandfather this week. If you are grieving in some way this morning, know that you are not alone. When one part of the body grieves, the whole body feels it. We are grieving with you. But more than that, we have a heavenly helper and comforter, God himself. And God is not distant nor aloof. He is close to the brokenhearted. Our prayer for you is that you know God's presence, God's peace, God's grace and comfort. In other news, we have an exciting announcement video regarding next weekend. Take a look. Well, hello, Cornerstone Church. Greetings from your friends at One Life down here in KZN. We've missed you. Joburg volleys over the July holidays. What happened? You normally flock down here to our beaches. But life is really different, isn't it, with uh, COVID? And um, we've pretty much been homebound. But we've managed to organize a permit or two, and I will be coming up this next weekend, 14, 15, 16, to hang with you guys. We'll be preaching there on Sunday. I'm bringing some people with me. My son, who many of you young guys know, and a couple of other young guys, we're gonna have a blast. Looking forward to seeing you. If you're interested in getting baptized, or finding out more about it, then please take note of the information as it comes up on the screen. There is an online course coming soon and perhaps even pause the video now and take down these details. Likewise, if you are new to Cornerstone Church and have not participated in our introductory course called DNA, then please take note of the details on the screen now as we have an online course that is just for you. This coming Friday, the 14th, from 6 p.m. until Saturday, 6 p.m., the elders and pastors will be fasting and praying. And we are asking that if you can, then join us as we stop, trust, speak, and listen to God together. It's National Women's Day today. So women, girls, sisters, mothers, daughters, aunts, grandmothers, great-grandmothers, great-great-grandmothers, know that you are loved and appreciated, and we celebrate you today. We will continue now, as is fitting, by lifting our eyes, our hands, and our hearts to God in praise and worship. If your soul is heavy this morning, then praise Jesus, because He is the lifter of your burdens. And if you were distracted this morning, then lift your eyes and trust Jesus and trust that Jesus really is the thing that you're looking for. If you are fearful this morning, then lift your heart to Jesus who is love itself and encounter God afresh. And if you find yourself in a good space already this morning, then rejoice because now you get to join your brothers and sisters and all of creation in worshiping the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Let's worship together.
In these incredibly uncertain days and challenging days, um, and as it has been throughout history, uh, there are times when we go through challenge, we go through uh, extremes. It's important that we don't lose sight of the anchor of our souls, and that is Jesus Christ. We, these moments are incredibly important, where we take time to just slow right down and not only congregationally, but individually. And we just allow our hearts to begin to reflect on how good He is. We need a bigger vision. We need um, our understanding, our emotions, our minds renewed in His presence. Because it's in that place of worship, it's in that place of lifting up our hearts to Him, that we are restored, we get fresh vision and we understand things in perspective if we don't have those moments then what happens is the immediacy of the situation the challenges the storms that rage and just the ways in which the evil one kind of rises up can overwhelm us and I want to encourage us like we've done here now is just allow ourselves to be lost in His presence. Then sings my soul, how great you are. That's what needs to come from the church. We've got a message. It's not political. It's not emotional trickery. It's not philosophical um, uh, debate. It's then sings my soul, how great you are. We've got a Savior, a sure anchor to our souls. And so, Father, what a privilege it is this morning to join our voices together and proclaim that Christ is King. Proclaim that He is the one who has given us life. And we pray that over Johannesburg. We pray it over Gauteng. We pray it over South Africa. We pray it over every single person we know who's not born again. And we trust that this city will be revived. Keep helping us understand the importance of worship, Lord. Paul and Silas are in prison, in pitch blackness, hurting, and they lift up their voices and begin to sing songs of praise to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so we do that, Lord. And through that, we just sense your grace, your peace, your power, your love, Lord. So as we look at your word now, we trust you for revelation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Really do. The theme for our time of prayer and fasting, as I said on our pastoral update, is when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard. And for me, the standard is born-again believers filled with the gospel, worshiping him. And so I encourage you, get ahead and start to pray and start to fill yourself uh, just with a greater vision of who He is because that's what prayer and fasting is about, is us coming back to that place of realizing how good Christ is. Last week we uh, took up the new theme that we're busy working through with our series, which is the gospel of the kingdom. We looked at the life of Jesus as He introduced that statement, the gospel of the kingdom, the summary of his life is he preached, he taught, and he demonstrated 
the gospel of the kingdom. With the coming of Christ, history was split in two. And now when we look back on that moment, is we see life before Christ and we see life after Christ. And every single person on this planet should see life in that way. And I want to encourage you this morning to understand the power of conversion, the importance of being born again. Uh, the very fact Christ came to this earth was, was not to introduce us to a higher way of thinking. Even though Christianity is a higher way of thinking, Jesus came to save us from our sin and to kind of transfer us through His grace into a kingdom. This gospel of the kingdom is the mechanism that takes what was lost and now it becomes found. It gets into this, we, we get into this place of our sins are forgiven and we have a future. And so this morning we are going to look at an introduction to Paul's life. We're going to read a lot of scripture and I'm going to make some comments uh, basically just to help us understand these scriptures. But we're going to look at Paul's conversion. For us to best understand the gospel of the kingdom, we need a fresh understanding of the power of conversion. You see, Christ came and took what was dead and made it alive. Uh, he showed us the possibility of a new life in him. And Paul, who initially started out uh, exactly on the opposite road, uh, has this amazing conversion. And through that, he begins to understand the power of the gospel of the kingdom. And through his ministry, the gospel goes out and impacts a large part of the world. So let's begin with looking at Acts chapter 7, verses 54 to 60. And we see that Paul is complicit in the murder of the first martyr. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged. And they ground their teeth at him. This is Stephen preaching the gospel and saying, You yourselves have killed the author of life. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, that Stephen, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So important was this moment that Christ was standing. He was kind of watching. He, he kind of was keen on what was going on. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out, with the, out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is our introduction to a man who had become Paul, the great apostle, who had write most of the New Testament, who would get a great revelation of, of the message of the gospel and a, a, a revelation of the church itself. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. What a dramatic moment. Uh, really, it, it is, it's hard to believe that a man who's got rocks thrown at him, at his head in particular, probably you know, dizzy from that. He's going to die from that. He's bleeding. He's hurting. But yet he, he has the, the wherewithal to, to kind of focus on those who are stoning him and don't hold the sin against them. And I believe at that point something must have happened in Paul's heart. Saul, the, the, the kind of zealous Pharisee, something happened over there. Some, something must have been sown at that time. Uh, something kind of began to change because later on we're going to see uh, that the Spirit of God impacts him in a great way and he has this radical conversion. Just a few points out of that passage. Stephen and Philip, later on Philip preaches to a town in Samaria. Stephen uh, has this opportunity to preach the sermon. Kind of show us that even though they are appointed as deacons, the job was not just about menial tasks but ministering powerfully. And all of us have been anointed by God to minister powerfully. It's not just up to the great apostles. 
Uh, here we have an opportunity for the gospel to be preached to the most hostile audience. You would have thought, let's choose Peter, who's bold, who later on, um, or early on, had preached most of the sermons. So let's use Peter. No, there's no hierarchy in the kingdom. And I want to encourage you, every single one out there, uh, perhaps your job isn't, you know, a leader in the church or, you know, an anointed elder or whatever it is. Uh, you know, somehow you find yourself in your mind just doing menial things in the church. But God anoints all of us so that we can preach the gospel. Priesthood of believers doctrine says that every part of this body is important. And so God wants to use you in, a, in an amazing way. We also see that preaching the gospel will always require paying the price. Always. And in some instances with our lives. And so the foundation has been laid for us to kind of rise up. For me, revival is the church rising up with its primary message being this gospel of the kingdom. And to understand that I'm not going to do this at my convenience. I'm going to do this because it's required. That's the call of God on us. That should be the very motivation of our lives, is this gospel's got to go out at all costs. And it will cost us something. In our country, not death at the moment, but boy, you're going to lose friends. I remember the time I'd become born again, and our friends just disappeared. Previously, they were kind of stuck to me. You know, we, were, we did everything together, but the minute I announced that my Savior was Jesus Christ, uh, I got a few bad mouths. I got people swearing at me. I got people abandoning me. Uh, for, for some reason, there was this rare disease that I'd contracted. Anyway, you're going to pay a price. And then we see Paul present at the stoning of Stephen. Next uh, passage of Scripture I want to read is Acts chapter, one, verses one, uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. Paul ravages the church. So Paul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentations over him. Verse 3, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. This was a bad guy. <laughs> he wasn't just, you know, averagely against the gospel. You know, had a few snide remarks. No, Paul was bent on this mission of destroying Christianity. How dare this group of people claim that Jesus was the Son of God? He'd been trained by, by a, a, a teacher, and now he had picked up this kind of zealous pursuit of wiping out this threat. It's interesting. He goes from house to house looking for Christians. You've got to know how serious you are about kind of seeing Christianity wiped out if you go from house to house. It's not just looking for public demonstrations, but he's kind of picking up rumors of who possibly could be a Christian, and from house to house, He's going there and hauling people out of, them, out of those houses and, and ensuring that they go to prison. Later on, here's the irony, Paul goes from house to house preaching the good news, making the gospel known. That is a radical conversion. And you know, every single one of us, we have a past where we never served God. And it, you may not have been one who persecuted Christians or put them in prison or... You know, you were a slave trader or a drug dealer or some kind of bad dude. But without Christ, you were bad. You were a sinner. Without Christ, you were kind of bent on destruction. And there's the separating moment, and that's where the gospel of the kingdom comes in. The gospel of the kingdom reaches in to that dark black pit of death and destruction, and it translates us, it kind of transfers us into the kingdom of light, as it did with Paul. I wonder when Paul eventually did go preaching from house to house, if he remembered this moment of persecuting from house to house. You see, Paul, I feel, is an inspiration to each one of us. It doesn't matter how hard we are, it doesn't matter how difficult the circumstances are around us, or how anti-God we are, is there is always hope in Christ. And for us who perhaps have family or friends who are like that, I need to encourage you with that, that there is hope. My testimony is kind of 
there, there are some dramatic parts to my testimony. Uh, I remember kind of getting saved uh, one particular Sunday after people had prayed for me for a year. That was awesome. I remember shaking knees. I remember a confused mind. Uh, I remember the desperation inside of me. I tried a whole lot of stuff. You know, it kind of just took me nowhere. Uh, and then when I heard the good news for the first time, it was, yes, this is it. And then when they explained the gospel to me after I'd prayed, I realized I need to be baptized in water. I just remember the peace that came over me. I remember kind of a whole week of uh, kind of cold turkey. God, by His power, delivered me from, you know, drug addiction and the need for it and so on. And, you know, without taking it, I uh, spent a couple of nights really sweating it out. And uh, kind of the next weekend was time for water baptism. All I knew is I need to get in that water and I need to be baptized. I remember standing in the water and the kind of old preacher, I say old, he was about my age, 65, <clears throat> and he said to me, young man, are you serious? I still had stains in my hand from smoking, you know, dope pipes and uh, my hair was all bushy and afro. I had Moroccan beads around my neck and, you know, leather around my wrists and that. But I'd throw my stuff away, all my paraphernalia, all my drugs, I'd flush down the toilet and so on. And I said, yeah, I'm dead serious about this. This is an important moment for me. And before I knew it, he had got hold of me and put me under the water. And I remember just everything went black. And I came up out of the water speaking in tongues. That was weird. I hadn't heard tongues before. I'd heard that uh, there was a language like this, but I'd never heard it. I'd never been taught about it. But God filled me with His Spirit straight away. And I could just feel the, the joy of heaven, the, the peace of God all over my life. And I knew then that I'd been called to, to help people get saved. I wanted to kind of just tell young people who were in this way of life, young adults and so on, the kind of generation that I was part of, that there's life beyond all of this stuff. And it's important that you get born again. That was radical for me. And like I said, I lost a whole lot of friends. I had friends saying to me, look, I tried this whole born again stuff, it's rubbish. Uh, and I kind of had to work through that. But I became a loud mouth for Jesus, I really did. Um, and then later on, uh, <laughs> my mom said, one of the friends from high school pastors a church on the South Coast. And uh, she sent me his phone number and I phoned him and I said, I'm coming to see my mom. Can I come and have a coffee with you? And when I got to sit and have coffee with him, this buddy of mine says, I can't believe you're born again. <laughs> I can't even believe that, you, that you're leading a church. You know, how did this happen? And I told him. And he said, you know, when we were at high school, you really gave me a hard time. And I'd almost forgotten about a lot of that stuff. I, I just remember his dad was a evangelist to set up a tent around Durban and preach the gospel and uh, kind of saw miraculous things happen. His dad was known in Durban for healing miracles and radical salvations and that. And on Mondays at school, he would tell the class, you know, uh, when there was a bit of report back of what happened on the weekend. And apparently, I remember it, I kind of had a go at him. I used to say, so was Jesus the clown? in the tent this Sunday, or was Jesus the trapeze artist? And uh, he said, that hurt me. I went home and my mom and dad kind of prayed for me. And, and he said, often the, some of the Christians in the class would get together to pray for you. You, you hurt us. And uh, he said, I found it very difficult to pray for your salvation, but I did. They were the seats for my conversion. And I'm thankful for that. And so with joy, I was able to share my testimony with this friend of mine, he still shook his head and said, I just don't know how this happened. <laughs> but by God's grace, here I am, kind of 40 years later, very thankful to God for what he did in my life. I've also seen testimony of that with my stepfather being born again, 30 years of prayer for him to get to that point. And so I encourage you that God is able to crack the hardest nut. He really is. And so we're going to read about Paul's conversion. Talk about a hard nut. He has a hard nut. Chapter 9, verse 1, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them 
bound to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. So, Paul's got his mission, his predetermined kind of thing he's going to do. He's kind of just thinking how many people he's going to jail, uh, thinking how that's going to translate into brownie points for him in heaven. And God meets him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless. <laughs> you can imagine hearing the voice but seeing no one. Wow. Saul rose from the ground and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. I believe at that time he was coming to terms with Stephen stoning, his actions. Suddenly the lights were coming on. I believe it. God had to blind him so he could begin to see spiritually. So uh, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen a vision. A man named Ananias came in and lays hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer. See, the gospel goes out that way for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. That must have been quite a thing for Ananias. <laughs> he knew this guy would, could easily chuck him in jail. But he had confidence. He had heard God, and he came and he prayed for this man. Uh, amazing. Uh, wonderful opportunity that he had to kind of see a ministry like Paul's launched. Uh, you know what? If we were to open our hearts to God, there are going to be many ways in which he's going to lead us, where we would have the privilege of seeing somebody launched into a ministry that is going to be far greater than ours. But I tell you, all it is, let's be obedient to what God says. And when we pray, don't only pray for you know, the situation around us. And I'm sure Ananias prayed, Lord, I just pray for the believers here in Damascus. Deliver us from evil Saul. <laughs> Please don't, <clears throat> you know, somehow just stop Saul. Send him back to Jerusalem or send him back to Tarsus. Uh, I'm sure that was the issue of, uh, that he prayed about. Uh, or save us as well from the, the Romans, uh, you know, because they were a persecuted a bunch. Uh, save us from the Jews. Save us from the Romans. But he heard God. And in those dire circumstances, God wants to lead us so we can do great exploits. But what an amazing conversion. For me, it's powerful. Powerful to see how this man was turned around 180 degrees. That's what repentance is about. Repentance is I was going on a road, doing my own thing, uh, away from God, uh, rebellion against God. It doesn't matter whether you were persecuting Christians or killing Christians, but without Christ, you were on a road away from God. And repentance means 180 degree turn. I want to encourage you to do that. If you've not done it ever before, it is so important that you're able to separate your life into a BC, a before Christ, and an after Christ. Uh, I've received Christ. The gospel of the kingdom has trans transformed me in a magnificent way. And, and this power of conversion is every one of us' uh, um, inheritance. God has appointed all of us to be born again. And so as strong an adversary as Paul was, he was able to be changed in that moment. 
as God by His Spirit challenged his heart. Uh, of course, it's dramatic. You know, the Damascus Road experience has become part of, you know, English idiom. It literally means this total change of a person who once was an adversary, now he, he kind of speaks out for that cause. Uh, you know, it's not even a Christian term anymore. It's just accepted as this conversion moment. This is the gospel. The gospel changes us, radically turns us around. And, and I tell you, it's like day and night. It's a change from night to day. I, I remember the thoughts that I'd had and the, the kind of ideologies I had and the philosophies in my heart. All of those just suddenly came into the light. And, and those things that weren't of God became less important. I had a new uh, kind of adventure that I wanted to live. You know, prior to Christ, my adventure was get to Europe, go and have a good time, go to Holland where, where kind of marijuana was, was legalized. This was the big dream that gripped my heart. I tell you, once Christ had come in, I wanted to plant a church in Hilbra. I wanted to see druggies saved. I wanted to see that place impacted with the gospel. Nothing's changed. It's gone from Hilbra to Joburg to the uttermost parts of the world. And that's what happened with Paul. And I want to encourage you. I tell you, it's very simple. It's, it's not a big deal. It really isn't. It's a big deal to do it. But the actual way of doing it is going to cost you nothing. But it's important that you see, if you haven't made that decision, you're on a road that's away from Christ. You walk in a road that is kind of eventually going to lead, lead to major destruction. And so without Christ, we cannot face this future. So I encourage you to to make that radical turnaround. See, repentance is two steps. It's changing your mind, changing your heart, and saying, actually, you know what? I need to repent of the sin. And then change your direction and say, I'm not going to walk in my way away from God. I'm going to walk toward God. That's what the prodigal did. He went back to the father, and he said, I've sinned. And the father said, bring the robe, bring the sandals, bring the ring, kill the fattened calf. And that's God. God wants to show us his righteousness. He wants to give us his righteousness. He wants to change us from slaves to sons and daughters. He wants to put his ring of authority on our finger. He wants to kill the fattened calf so that we can have an incredible celebration. So it's important. I want to encourage those who perhaps have got kind of very hard uh, kind of cases when it comes to people who are against the gospel in your family. Perhaps it's your spouse or your your kids, or perhaps it's aunts and uncles or friends you have, are just totally radically opposed to the gospel. They're outspoken, they persecute you, they mock you. Uh, they, they kind of try everything they can to convince you that you're doing the wrong thing. Don't give up praying for them. And I tell you, one day, an Ananias is going to get hold of them. God, by His Spirit, is going to lead somebody to speak to them. He's going to work the circumstances of their life. This is the gospel of the kingdom. It's powerful, and it's able to convert the hardest and get them to a place of having made that decision for Jesus. And, of course, we'll see in the weeks to come how Paul starts to become an agent of change. He becomes one who preaches and who kind of takes on the most challenging and dangerous circumstances for the sake of this gospel. Every single conversion is a Damascus Road experience. And it's important that we don't minimize the fact that you may not be in a, uh, be in a soul or some radical sinner. The fact that you've made that decision, spiritually it's a Damascus Road experience. You were against him and now you're for him. And I want to encourage you with that. So I'm just going to mention a few words of knowledge that uh, those who've been praying for us before have come up with. I know God is wanting to heal those. Um, somebody with shoulder pain, somebody that's right shoulder pain, lower back pain, reflux, <clears throat> and even nightmares or demonic thoughts. I feel as well, like Josh said right at the beginning, that God wants to comfort the brokenhearted. This Friday, one of my friends who are kind of... Um, did Bible college with. It was actually a couple that brought Adele and I together. Um, I did his celebration. Uh, 68 years old. Uh, he died of a heart attack. Uh, and it, it, there's a whole family grieving. But this I know is that God comforts those. And in that situation, he's able to bring about hope. 
And that's what I'm trusting God for you. Don't let sickness get you down. Let's trust God for hope, for, an, for His ability to lift you out of that situation and to give you hope. Um, and then, for those who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, get hold of us on Church Online. Get into the prayer room. We want to pray with you. We want to help you. And any of those words of knowledge and any issue you have in your heart, get hold of us on Church Online or through one of the WhatsApp uh, contacts or whatever, and we'd like to follow up on what's going on. But let me pray for us and trust God uh, for these things. Lord, you're a good God. We've sung about you. We've read your word. We've seen a dramatic conversion, and we've realized it's your desire to, Lord, let each of us go through that process so that we might have the hope that is our inheritance in Christ Jesus. We don't want the enemy to steal that hope, Lord. We don't want the enemy to confuse us. We don't want the enemy to keep us in darkness. And so I just pray now for that same light that blinded Saul and converted him, changed him, so that he could become a new person in Christ. That would happen for each of us. The light would shine in the darkness, and we'd realize the need for a Savior. We pray for that. Pray as we pray that prayer, Lord. Uh, those out there who have never prayed that prayer, um, that they would, Lord, just realize the, the extreme joy that there is in you and the privilege it is to become a son or a daughter of God. All those that are battling with pain, all those that are battling with hurt or fear, Father, I just pray they'd be delivered now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your grace on our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Just a point aside, today in the south, uh, they have a drive through and they have a drop-off, and they have drive-in. So please pray for them. They start their meeting a little later on. Have a great day.